So, um, thank you very much for choosing us in what's a very, very packed schedule and coming here um, for what I'm sure is going to be a, a, a useful and important discussion about making good, si good decisions in difficult or, and dangerous situations. And I should say difficult or dangerous situations. I'm sure that some of the examples that we're going to be giving are kind of very obvious kind of combat or conflict related situations, but there are, there are very, very many threats that working journalists face all the way through the different genres of journalism. Just coming into here, I was talking to Heather, who was telling me that uh, an investigative journalist who works on corruption cases um, and is particularly interested in the fishing industry regards some of the most dangerous stories that he's ever worked on had been working on stories to do with fishing policy because of connections to the mafia. So there are kind of a whole range of dangers and threats. Now, if we were talking about this, say, 20 or 30 years ago, um, that would be very, very unusual because I think it's only really in the last 10 or 15 years that people have started thinking more systematically about safety and also thinking about safety in the context of journal journalism education and kind of training sort of new entrants into the industry. And so while now particularly big media organizations have lots of um, safety programs in place, um, it's still very, very patchy uh, and certainly freelancers uh, and people who are working for smaller organizations, small newspapers and the like, um, are less likely to have the kind of benefit of the kind of organized safety response that, that big organizations have. Um, I'm going to very quickly introduce the panelists. They can introduce themselves much better than I can. So just very briefly, at the end of the table, we have Stuart Hughes, uh, who's an extremely experienced producer for the BBC. He's now the diplomatic producer. Um, but he'll tell you all about the stories that he's been worked on, and he'll be speaking last. Next to me is Hannah Storm, who's director of INSEE, that's the International News Safety Institute, um, and she works on a daily basis advising new t news teams and how they can keep themselves safe on a variety of stories. Uh, my name is uh, Gavin Rees, and I work for the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma. So I'm gonna be talking about another dimension to the safety equation, is um, what happens to us when we're working in violent situations um, psychologically. So in other words, um, how do we s respond to violence and how does that affect the way we think and consequently the decisions that we make. So very first up, um, Hannah. Good afternoon and thank you for attending what I hope is going to be a very interesting and informative discussion. I'm very aware that we come from different backgrounds, that the cross-section of people here in the audience provides a really interesting breadth of experience. So we really don't want to be uh, teaching you to suck eggs. We really want to hear from you about your experiences. At the end, we'll open up for questions, but if you feel like you want to share experiences with us of how you've prepared, please feel free to do that as well. I'd just like to also explain that before um, working for INSEE, I was a journalist for about 12 years working overseas in many locations um, in the Middle East, uh, in the Far East, in um, Europe and uh, South America and, and Haiti, working for various organizations such as the BBC, um, Reuters, uh, in newspapers, radio and TV and online. So how to prepare for making decisions in difficult or dangerous situations let me give you an example of how not to prepare. About three years ago, almost three years ago, I received a phone call from a team of journalists. They were going to Haiti. It was a few months after the devastating earthquake there. The infrastructure of the whole country had been shattered. Cholera had just broken out. Millions of people were homeless, hungry, and day-to-day -day survival was a really desperate fight. The phone call went like this. We're thinking of going to Haiti. Oh, okay, when are you thinking of going? The week after next, right? We're trying to figure out which hotel, which hotel to stay in. Is there a Sheraton or a Radisson or something like that? I'm afraid not. You might find a hotel with electricity in, though, if you're lucky. Oh, okay, well, can we hire a car when we get there? 
is there a Hertz or an Avis at the airport? And I said, no, no, no Hertz, no Avis, no. You might struggle to get into Haiti by the plane, but you could always take a car across the border, stock up on food and water and fuel before you leave the Dominican Republic. Food and water, really? I didn't, we hadn't thought of that. Why are we going to need fuel? At this point, I'm kind of going, hmm, hmm. Do you think we're going to need any injections before we get there? This lady says to me. And I said, you do know there's a cholera outbreak, don't you? She said, and after a couple of seconds, we both kind of agreed with one another that perhaps they ought to rethink their trip. Now, I understand that most journalists are not as hopeless as this particular one, although sadly, some of them still are. However, no matter where you're going and whatever situation you're going to end up in, I would say that most journalists, all journalists, need to prepare for the story about going out and facing the situations they face, how to mitigate the potential risk that they're going to face, and how to put themselves in a really good situation to make the decisions when potentially time is not on their side and, and danger is just around the corner. You know, when we talk about difficult and dangerous situations, we often automatically think of war zones. Now, I'm fairly sure that not everybody who faces a dangerous situation is going to be in a war zone. We could talk about environmental disasters, we could talk about civil unrest, humanitarian crises, strikes, even sporting events. All of them can and occasionally do pose a risk for us as journalists. They're not all going to be deadly, they're not all going to be really, really dangerous, but they do require a degree of forethought. The army in Britain has a saying which is the seven Ps. It's prior preparation and planning prevents piss poor performance. Now for me, it doesn't necessarily have to be seven Ps, but I tend to break it down into four areas. So practically, and forgive me if I'm teaching people things or I'm telling people things that they've heard a million and ten times, Practically, I want to look at four areas very briefly. The first one is training. The second one is research. The third one is equipment. And the fourth one is communication and contingency. So training. Now, we're not all members of the BBC. We're not all able to receive the fantastic safety training to, you know, before we go to hostile environments. However... We are all in a position where we can train ourselves or speak to colleagues to get some basic training or find first aid courses or even afford as a freelancers access to what we call safety training courses. And I would urge you, I would absolutely urge you when you think about going to these dangerous places to think of this as an investment in your future, in your decision making process. It's not a lot of money. In fact, you can make that money back pretty easily in a couple of days if you wanted to as a freelancer, but that training is crucial. Now, you might never need to know how to apply a tourniquet if they teach on a course, but the learning on these courses will allow you an extra bit of time to think if it does go wrong. It should prepare and not scare you, and as we'll hear from Stuart a little later on, it can help reinforce the ability to keep calm under fire. On to research, and this, I would say, is absolutely crucial to it. You wouldn't go into a story not having done any background research, would you? You would go and do a story and not know the per name of the person you're interviewing, not know what their background is, not know what their, their, their profile is. So why on earth do some people go into dangerous situations without having done any research about the country or the place or the culture or the environment that they're going to? So as well as need needing to know what your story is, this is what I suggest you, you research. You should look at the climate of the country you're going to. Are you going to be functioning in hot weather? Really hot weather, because that can cause a heck of a problem. Or cold weather. Are you likely to be in an earthquake situation? Are there wildfires, etc., etc.? You should know about any diseases, particularly malaria, and the kind of drugs that, that you need to take to, uh, to combat those. You need to have up-to-date travel information, including infrastructure issues, roads, transport, uh, planes, rails. Um, and you need to look at if there's any potentially divisive political and ethnic issues of which you need to be aware. Now, this is one of the most sensitive issues we, we, we have to face as journalists. And also be aware of any issues you might need to consider in terms of religious festivals happening at the time, religious traditions that you need to be aware of. And specifically for women, for the ladies out there, um, it's particularly important to know about any cultural traditions in place that might require you to... to 
wear certain kinds of clothing or, or take scarves with you to cover, to cover your head. And if you're not going in by yourself, it's absolutely crucial that you know something of the team with which you're going to be working. Now, there's a number of various good websites for that. I can talk you through them afterwards, but various things like the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in, in the UK, uh, the CIA has a website, AlertNet has a website, and there's one called Red R in, in, in the UK. On to equipment, um, I could spend an hour and a half talking to you just about what to take to a dodgy place. I'm not going to do that. Make it as lightweight as possible. Make sure you have the right equipment for the culture, for the climate, and for the uh, potential conflict. What I do want to briefly talk to you about is what we call a grab bag. A grab bag. It's basically what you need to pack in time and to use in times of heightened danger and what will sustain you for 24 to 48 hours. So if you get caught under fire for 24 to 48 hours, if you get caught in a house you can't leave, if you get caught in an earthquake, this is what you need. Two days of clothing, some sturdy shoes, like walking boots or something like that, uh, photocopies of all your documents, visas, insurance, make sure you've got insurance. A photocopy of your passport, your press pass, some spare money, some water, a sterilization kit, food, cereal bars are really good. They keep your energy, they're small, they're light, they don't melt. A first aid kit, wet wipes, which are my favorite, absolute favorite, toilet roll, a head torch with batteries, sunscreen, a scarf or a hat, a pen knife, insect repellent, I'm nearly there, and malaria tablets, and any other medication you personally take. It is amazing how much time planning that and having that in a bag, how much time that can save you. You run out of the house, you grab it. Finally, and my, my final one of the four is, is communication and contingency. As far as you can, know and plan where you're going. That includes roadmaps, if possible, of the place, if you deem it safe and secure enough to take the maps into the country or the place you're going to. And all the background you possibly can about contacts and numbers of, of, the, contact, of the people and sources you're going to be talking to, potentially. And also bear in mind that how you save those in your phone in case that may impact on the security of the people you're, you're dealing with. Um, just in terms of how you then use those communications with the people you're working with, leave a list of the contacts and your planned itinerary with your news desk. If you don't work with the news desk, if you're freelance, leave it with somebody you trust. And then plan on checking in with them every so often. Agree an amount of time that you're going to check in with them in case it goes wrong. If it's an incredibly dangerous place, check in more often. If it does go wrong, then at least you have a fallback mechanism in place, which we call a contingency plan. We have something in place in case it goes horribly wrong, as, as, as we will hear a little bit more in the future. This is your homework. You research your story. You research your plan. You're going out. You're preparing yourself. It's about taking responsibility. But I think, from my experience, as well as the preparation, it's also about knowing yourself. It's knowing that moment when your gut says to you, whoa, uh, I'm not going in there, that's dodgy. I don't feel happy about that taxi driver. I don't feel happy about that hotel because we've had a few aftershocks recently and, and I don't feel happy about that building because you know, the walls aren't really thick enough if it comes under, under fire. I'm gonna pass, on to, pass it on to the other guys now but please do feel free to ask questions afterwards. Actually, shall, shall we just take a couple of quick questions just to see, so what we'll do I think, um, otherwise we'll, we'll all talk at you for 15 minutes and, and it may be, particularly after I've talked at you probably, you'll give up the will to live. Um, so maybe if we take a couple of questions after each presentation and at the end um, what we'll do is we'll go into a lot more detail. So anybody, any comments, any thoughts they want to pick up on now? I think there's a hand over there. If we could have a microphone, that would be great. Very quickly, I'm a student of the Master in uh, International Journalism at City University. They stressed us uh, about this issue. I've taken personally a um, HEFAC hostile environment course, and um, every week uh, it came um, a lecture about this kind of stuff. Uh, so now I understand uh, that is very, very important. And I think that 
person, as a, um, we as a, a wannabe journalist, the, our um, generation is more aware of this issue, probably, of the other journalists. Just a comment on this. Great, thank you. Any more thoughts? Yeah. Hi. Um, just out of curiosity, could you give us an example of a dangerous situation you found yourself in and how you dealt with it? Um, probably the easiest situation is I was in Haiti after the earthquake. Um, I, half of my team decided to go and stay in a hotel that I did not deem to be a safe hotel. I've lived through various earthquakes in the past and I made the call for the team to go and stay in a campsite with the, one of the rescue crews. That night there was a massive aftershock, a 6.2 aftershock. And um, one of the people of the other crew broke their leg jumping out of the window of the hotel and everybody else was uh, pretty traumatized by the situation. So I think just having the preparation, having been in similar experiences myself and having had the kind of forethought to go, you know what, this hotel, they might have the satellite truck or the satellite dish or the ability to send uh, uh, satellite, uh, you know, news, news via satellite, but and it might take us more, half an hour more to get there, but I don't think it's worth it. And I think I was probably right in retrospect. So one of the things that we can talk about, um, and certainly at the end, it would be really good if it doesn't come up enough in our presentations, is to talk about working in teams, because often these situations, particularly um, if you're working for an organisation or even if you're a freelance, um, you're likely to team up with other journalists. And there's a whole question about how the, <laughs> how the conflicts play out and whether you know, maybe somebody with a very strong ego dominates the team and how you make decisions as a group. You know, it's quite easy to kind of fall into sort of sheep mode and find yourself doing things that you don't necessarily want to do. So we should talk about that. Um, if we can have the PowerPoint slide up now. Uh, yes, great. So as um, I said in my introduction, I work for the DART Centre for Journalism and Trauma. And so when we're um, doing you know, um, events and uh, kind of sort of training sessions and organising meetings, they normally kind of approach the issue of trauma through two main doors. One is uh, issues to do with how do we work effectively with people who have been impacted on by violent events. So in other words, um, what decisions do we, do we need to think about when we're interviewing people? How do we approach people sensitively without making it a worse experience for them? Um, and the other aspect is safety. So what about the impact of trauma on ourselves? Um, it's possible working in, in situations when one's witnessing appalling violence or facing um, constant threat to suck that material into oneself and to find that one's own health starts to suffer. Now, all of our um, materials um, come from working you know, with journalists in the field and um, also from conversations that we have with psychology experts, people who are traumatic stress specialists. And they could be military psychiatrists who work um, with soldiers who are experiencing combat stress. Or they could be child um, psychologists who are working with children who have been affected by things like domestic abuse. And what's happened in the last kind of 10 or 15 years of research is we've got a much better picture than we've ever had before of, uh, of the kind of neuroscience of trauma and of how our decision making can be influenced by the things that we're exposed to. Um, and the headline, which I'll give, you away, give away partly the secret of the presentation straight away, is that our trauma responses are sometimes extremely useful because they're there to encourage our survival and they're sometimes less useful. So I'll kind of go into a bit more detail about that and try and explain why. Now, in case you're wondering, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, um, but as I said, I hang out with a lot of psychologists and a lot of psychiatrists. So I'm hoping there isn't a fully blown neuroscientist in the room who can, who can prove me wrong. So I'm gonna give you a slightly kind of simplified cartoon version but at least you don't have to look at lots of slides with graphs and p-values and um, bizarre chemical formulas and that kind of thing. Um, so hopefully it'll be comprehensible. Um, this often comes up, um, particularly in situations where violence starts to feel normal. 
So, for instance, in the Mexican border area, where in places like Juarez, where there have been appalling killings, um, not just of uh, criminals, but of civilians and also of journalists, all caused by the narco drug wars. Um, or if we think about situations in a, like places like Iraq, which experienced an enormous density of violence, not just as a consequence of the 2000 and three invasion, but also the consequence of the years of dictatorship under Saddam Hussein. And it's quite easy for journalists coming from those regions to, to start to say, well, you know, this is just normal, isn't it? This is what we have to live with. And my answer to that is that violence is actually never normal. I mean, it might appear to be normal. It might be every day. Uh, it might be all over the, it might be everywhere and it might feel that it's inescapable but it's not normal and it's not normal in the sense that what happens is it catapults us into a survival mode so this is a picture from uh, one of Hannah's favorite places it's a picture from Haiti uh, and it's during the earthquake a photograph by Ron Habib we don't know what this guy is thinking or feeling it's impossible to to judge but if you look at his face, there's something going on. He's not quite in a normal place. One of the beauties of this picture is it kind of, it looks, it's almost become a kind of new normality. But essentially, he's, he's going through some kind of trauma response. And to simplify things, there are two main categories of reactions that happen when we're in violent situations. One is hyperarousal. So think of an enormous injection of adrenaline into the bloodstream and other stress hormones. So one could be wired, very alert, very awake, aware of what's going around, slightly buzzery, buzzing, kind of jittery, highly emotional. If somebody was to walk behind this guy and clap him on the shoulder, he'd probably spin around at extreme speed, faster than he would do normally. And that's an adrenaline reaction. So we, we get a lot of our stress survival responses from our deep evolutionary heritage. Essentially, they share some similar brain structures to animals like lizards and birds, which have the same kind of trauma response. Um, and we're not necessarily very good at dealing with these because one of the, for instance, one stress response is the need, is the need to evacuate one's bowels. You know, we shit ourselves and piss ourselves. And people think, well, you know, this, isn't, this is you know, terribly embarrassing and shameful. But that becomes because, in evolutionary terms, it's preparing the body for flight to run. So fight and flight responses. Uh, if you look at animals on wildlife films and you, you see them, that they, just before the lion is attacking the gazelle, the gazelle will evacuate its bowels. And it does that because it can run faster. And when I was a kid, I used to do competitive athletics. And before the 100 meters race, everybody went to the loo. So it's a kind of survival response. It's something, yeah, it's something, or even just before speaking. Um, it's something that we, we have to do. And there are all sorts of strange effects from this. Like one of them is that blood moves away from the periphery, so we become pale. And instead, it bathes the main organs and the muscles. And if you're cut in a traumatic situation, you bleed less if you've had time to have a trauma response beforehand. People are also capable of using their muscles more fully so they can lift heavier weights when they fear they might be killed. So there are all kinds of beneficial things from this heritage we have. So if that's kind of hyperarousal, there's another one which is called hypoarousal, which is the reverse, and that's the system shutting down. Um, so think of an animal that plays dead and it kind of collapses to the ground, it loses kind of body tension. It appears to be um, dead meat, effectively. That's also a kind of survival strategy. Now the thing about humans is that we do both of them and we can never actually necessarily predict what we do when we do them. So in this case, a hypo-arousal reaction might be to not feel anything at all. So to cut off from one's feeling. And as Hannah was just saying, that actually gut instinct is really important. And so if you can't feel your gut instinct because you're kind of feeling emotionally um, kind of subdued or not available, um, that can sometimes play badly. But sometimes it can be very, very useful if there are lots of 
horrible um, things happening around one, then the ability to just kind of throw it out of the window can be helpful. I mean, mobilize ourselves for action rather than worrying too much about what we're seeing. I was talking to a, a journalist who's been working in Syria recently, um, and we were talking about fear, which we're going to talk about a little bit again, again later. And he was saying, you know, I don't understand all this stuff about people getting scared, because I find that when there's a gunfight happening, I just fall asleep. So in other words, he's kind of tucking himself up in the rubble and uh, having a snooze uh, because he's having a hypo-arousal reaction. I mean, he's a very mellow guy. There could be other, other things involved as well. Um, but I think that's worth knowing about. Can you see the picture there? Um, it's a kind of silly picture. So the question for you is what happens when the pilots turn their head? And because of the microphone, I'm going to tell you the answer. It's a bit strange. So basically what happens when they turn their head is that they respond to the plane before they know that it's a plane. So what they'll do is they'll turn and go, oh, a, a plane, steer. So in other words, before they can have a conscious thought or think and understand and form a picture in their head, their body is already mobilizing. So you'll have experienced that yourself. If you've cycled a bicycle and you move the wheel too quickly, suddenly you feel a lurch in the stomach. That's the adrenaline kicking in. And then you think, ah, oh, right, yeah, I've got to steer the, steer the thing left. So there's a delay. Um, and that's because that the automatic trauma response, the survival system, works five times faster than the conscious thinking system. So if this is a kind of rudimentary model of the brain, this uh, thing here, which is the amygdala, um, kicks off immediately that the threat is seen, communicates to the back of the brain. There's no picture formed, but the back of the brain controls movement, so you start moving. And then very, very slowly, the, the image and the cognitive processes get to this part of the brain here, which is the prefrontal cortex. So that means that we feel before we think. And so a lot of situations um, that we, we might feel bad about that because, hey, we're journalists, you know, we're rational, logical people, we do a lot of thinking. But sometimes in stressful situations, our thinking takes a while to come online. Um, and that's actually kind of very, very important in the way that we kind of process responses in, in violent situations. Because also the emotional parts of the brain to do with things like um, fear, distrust. If we develop very quick feelings of distrust, they may be triggered before our intellectual faculties kick in. And so one of the things that happens in traumatic situations is that there's often, we often tend to think of things in kind of, in very kind of strong terms, that there's a, an argument in a group, everybody gets very, very upset, things get heated very, very quickly, and maybe we're not operating quite the same way we would do in another situation. And that can be the trauma talking, rather than just the fact that the people we're working with are arseholes or lazy or stupid or not thinking or whatever. Uh, again, something worth remembering. Uh, you'll know what this is, I hope. This is a picture of um, James, uh, James Bond. It's a kind of James Bond signature picture. It's being reused. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is that the the round circle is actually the barrel of a gun. And there's a phenomenon called gun fixation. So if you point a, a gun in somebody's face, very often all they can describe when the police arrive is exactly what the gun barrel looked like. So very often witnesses an armed crime don't know, the f they, they haven't seen, processed, absorbed the face of the person who's pointing the gun at them. All they see is the barrel of the gun. And that's because the automatic threat response system that we all have has kicked in straight away. And it's thinking, danger, what's danger? Oh, gun barrel, danger, danger, prime danger. And it's not bothering to kind of look at the rest of the, the scene. So this is one of the reasons that law enforcement officers and people in the military get a lot of training in getting used to these situations so that they have automatic reactions and know what to do. So a policeman, you know, might 
uh, will hopefully have, uh, have understood this situation and will be aware that they need to kind of look out and see what else is in the scene around them. Uh, it's not automatic, though. Um, so this is my main proposition for you. Um, and I'm only going to speak for another, gosh, I don't know, um, another um, 10 minutes or so. And so this is a, a, an invitation to you, really, is to maybe do some research about trauma and trauma reactions and to think about the situations that it could apply to you. Um, because the more knowledge that we have about how we respond to trauma, the better prepared we are to deal with it. Um, this is um, a picture of a, a squirrel that's ruined uh, a lovely photograph. Now, I don't know if you've ever um, seen a squirrel that thinks it's about to be attacked by a cat. And what happens is, you know, the cat arrives, squirrel goes up like this, has its kind of stress response. Cat goes away, squirrel <sighs> relaxes, carries on, plays, you know, eats a nut or something. Cat comes back, and then bang. It's up again. Cat goes away and it relaxes. Now, if you look at squirrels, this part of the brain, the head, isn't very well developed. So it doesn't really have much of a prefrontal cortex. It's not doing a lot of thinking. I don't know if you've noticed, but squirrels don't normally read newspapers. Uh, it's very rare to see a squirrel reading a newspaper. Um, so a squirrel can turn off its stress response but unfortunately, we're human beings uh, and very complicated uh, mechanisms, very complicated philosophical existential entities. And we have long life histories and long experiences, and they all can overlap. So it can be very hard for us to know when we're out of danger and when we're in a safer place. Um, in, this is a, quite an old example now, it's of 2005. Um, a journalist working for The Guardian was in China. He was driving along uh, a road to go to a village where there had been lots of um, ecological protests. His car, he was in the car with a driver and an activist, um, was stopped by a roadblock, a roadblock of kind of thugs, essentially. The um, activist got out to talk to the, the people by the side of the road. Uh, they attacked him. He was punched viciously, lay on the ground. Now, this journalist who was working for The Guardian looked out of the, the window, and what he saw was the activist's neck snapped, um, his eye out, and a kind of his tongue hanging out of his mouth. So he thought, I'm not going to get out of the car. They've just killed somebody in front of me. I'm going to stay in the car. So he and the driver um, reversed, drove away, and he wrote up this story saying, didn't completely confirm it, saying that it was, you know, that this man had been, if not killed, um, very critically injured. And it was the front, it was the headline of The Guardian. But then, a few days later, there was a knock on his door, and it was the activist there. And he was a bit bruised, um, and he didn't look too good, but he certainly wasn't in the condition that the journalist had seen. Now, the journalist in question had worked in um, the South African townships, and he had seen killing in other places. And what appears to have happened is that his brain filled in the gaps. So the kind of hot fragments of past memory were interlaced with what he was seeing. So it looked much, much worse than it actually was. This was very embarrassing for the newspaper because they had to apologize to the Chinese government. And so there's a whole question about how our judgment is affected by our experience, whether we're really in the present or whether we're responding to things that have happened in the past. That's, again, worth factoring in. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about fear because um, I think most of us, certainly I do, have quite ambivalent feelings about fear because we think it's bad you know, to, to be scared. Um, um, I, I do kind of climbing and, and mountaineering, and so that's probably, I'm not a combat journalist, it's probably the most sort of dangerous thing that, that I do. Now, one of the biggest causes of death amongst climbers and mountaineers is um, forgetting to tie the, the rope to your belt properly, to your harness, and then abseiling off. And that's not very good, because you have to be attached to the rope when you're abseiling off. And it appears to be what happens is that people get blasé, is that they lose 
their kind of sense of uh, danger. And so a lot of um, people I know who are really good climbers, I'm not a really good climber, but these people are kind of top climbers, uh, when they're selecting a team, they, don't, they won't want to climb with somebody who has no fear. So if you're working in a group of journalists and you're going to a dangerous place and there's somebody who says, I'm not scared of anything, then um, I think very carefully about whether that's the right person to work with, personally. Um, so this is a special forces guy from America um, who's talking about fear as a kind of friend, that you need to, to learn how to listen to it. But the problem about that is that too much fear isn't such a good friend. So this is somebody learning to climb, and that's, that's pretty dangerous. If he falls, he will probably die. Um, but it's kind of well within his grade, and he's a little bit scared, but just scared enough to hold on. He knows his limits. As Hannah said, know thyself is kind of like one of the most important things about working in stressful situations. Now, he's not going to try and do this. Uh, that looks like a photoshopped picture. It looks like this guy has been stuck to the rock. It's, uh, but he's one of the world's greatest climbers, a guy called James McAfee. And so his kind of fear response is in a very, very different place because he's, he's trained it. He knows situations. He's learnt where he's at. So if we were going to translate this to um, young journalists who are interested in um, working on kind of difficult and stressful things, is maybe not start off by um, booking a, a, a one-way um, bicycle trip into Aleppo, um, but starting somewhere, or working somewhere abroad on a story that's more, um, uh, you know, that, that, that maybe raises issues, but not kind of such fundamentally terrifying issues as this kind of situation would. Um, this is again about, I was interested in this about teams, because I think it's quite interesting, is that um, a lot of the, if you, re you should read one of these books actually, um, if you're thinking about working teams, there's one here called Into Thin Air, and it's again based on mountaineers. Unfortunately, as a journalism community, we've not been very effective at writing very much about group um, processes and decision making and how we operate in, in groups. But if you read some of these accounts of big mountain disasters, you may see the parallels. Um, often what happens is that people are in a, in a group and that there's one person who deals with their distress by challenging themselves, by throwing themselves into the danger. So if we're feeling anxious or agitated or worried about something, one way of getting instant relief can be to approach the danger. So that's their way of dealing with it. But then if they're in a group of people who maybe aren't so good at speaking up for themselves, suddenly this kind of group thing can happen. And all the agreements, safety agreements that their people have made, like it's important to get off the mountain early in the day before the weather sets in. So if you haven't got to a certain point by an agreed time, it's time to turn back. Those kinds of things go out of the window. And it's partly because of ego, um, but it's also because of a kind of natural summit fever. You know, if everybody's spent thousands of pounds getting somewhere, if everybody's made promises and told their friends and relatives that they're going to climb this mountain, or in the case of us as journalists, they're going to get this story and they're going to, you know, send pictures home and so forth, then the balance of judgment can go. So we're, you know, we're in the business of taking risks in our, in our work, but the question is, is the risk really worth it? And have we worked out before when we're going to say no and when we're going to walk back and when we're going to, you know, uh, take ourselves back and, and go home. Uh, yeah, I just want to make this point to, to, to end, really, is that stress is a good thing, um, but if you can see here, it's linked to performance. So no stress, no performance. We just kind of loll around and, um, I don't know, eat cake all day. Um, but with a bit of stress, we can manage to do kind of quite extraordinary things. But there comes a point when the, the stress is just too much, uh, and then we'll start to break down. It's the same with any natural resource. If you overuse it at a point, you know, it doesn't work anymore. If we overfish the oceans, there are no fish left. If we plumb our natural reserves, then we're not available to do our work later on. So we need to think about very simple things uh, in terms of looking after ourselves. We don't make good decisions when we're tired. 
We don't make good decisions when we're dehydrated. We don't make good decisions when um, we don't eat. And um, a big reason for that is that this part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex that I was talking about earlier, that helps us make complicated decisions, it starts to go offline if it's not hydrated and if it can't access glucose. Uh, and this is a really big thing. And again, lots of people like in the emergency services and the medical profession and the military are now taking sleep very, very seriously. Because, for instance, in the medical profession, they know that it, people start dying at the ends of doctor's shifts if they've not slept properly. So on that note, I'm going to finish off and uh, ask for a, if there are a couple of questions, and, and then we'll go on to Stuart. To a video I saw, m probably most of you saw it, uh, during the earthquake that uh, in Perugia in 1997, that image that went across the, the whole world of the San Francis ceiling falling, and uh, those people dead. And was w what was shocking for me was that they were dead because they were uh, probably uh, following their guts and um, uh, trying to find the exit. So how do you solve that balance between what your guts tell you and what your mind could tell you if you take the time to listen to your mind? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and I wish there was an easy answer to it. Um, I mean, the thing about the gut is that the better trained the gut is, so if the gut has more experience of being in certain situations, um, then the more likely it's to kick in and be helpful. I was talking to a journalist um, who was in... Uh, Sierra Leone, I think. Yeah, it was Sierra Leone. And he was due to go out into the countryside um, out of Freetown. And he was riding on a motorbike because he was going to do a story um, somewhere quite far down the, this long road. And about halfway on his trip, what happened is that his arm cramped so he couldn't control his arm. It went into a spasm and he, he could no longer accelerate the motorbike. Um, so he thought this is a bit weird and he wasn't feeling well. And so then he, he eventually decided to go back and then his arm started to move better. Um, he then found out later that day that two journalists who'd gone to do the same story had been killed further up the road. And what probably happened is that the road wasn't normal. So all of the experience he'd had of being in these situations, like, you know, there weren't children playing, it was strangely quiet. Um, it didn't feel right, and so his gut was being helpful, but he had a trained gut because he'd had kind of experience of similar situations. Um, so there are, you know, th it's a really a question of, of that, I think. Um, one quick question, then move on to Stuart. <coughs> or comment, yes, so at the front, please. Hi, um, I was just wondering if any of you are going to address um, how to behave in hostage situations or techniques for staying calm in hostage situations. Um, I worked as a journalist for four years in Yemen and was held hostage for several hours um, at gunpoint with uh, eight different men and was pregnant at the time. And so um, something as simple as, as yo like yo it's going to sound silly, but mm. yoga breathing I mean, I was concerned I was going <laughs> to give birth prematurely, but, but something as simple as yoga breathing was really useful, and it just helped me stay calm. You know, no one, I was with a couple of other women, and none of us panicked. And, but, I mean, I was just wondering if someone was going to talk about techniques for you know, when you're in a hostage situation and, and how to, to cope with that. Um, yeah, I mean, we could maybe... Uh, do you want to... Yeah, I mean, um, mine is... The, the I, mine is not a hostage situation as such, but I think some of the similarities I'd be interested to, for you to come back after I've spoken to see whether that, you know, any, anything I say resonates with you. So yeah. We can um, I mean, what I, I would say on that, let's come back to it a bit. But however, th thank you for the question, and also particularly thank you for the reference to yoga. Um, <laughs> because one of the things that's very helpful in high stress situations is things like breathing exercises, it's learning to kind of calm the stress system. So those climbers, they do breathing exercises. Um, and some of the yoga type exercises, the most extreme manifestation of those kind of calming exercises, uh, probably in the Japanese tradition. So samurai soldiers before going to war 
would do elaborate breathing exercises to calm down their nervous system because battle was so kind of terrifying. Um, and meditation and mindfulness as well are really, really useful because if one can slightly separate oneself from the situation and say, well, this is really terrible, I'm in this horrible, horrible place, but, you know, maybe there is a future, maybe there's somewhere else, if I can, you know, just do that, kind of separate oneself from the awfulness of it, then a lot of the um, research into resilience in hostage situations shows that that people do better. But it's a very complex area, and though I can um, point, if you talk to me later, I can um, point you towards a book that deals with some of these issues of people who were held hostage by the, the Viet Cong uh, and how they, what the strategies they developed to cope in those situations. Thank you for the question. So, Stuart, I'm just going to change the PowerPoint over while you introduce yourself. Please do. Um, I'm Stuart Hughes. I'm a World Affairs producer with the BBC based in London. Um, Thank you for coming. Uh, Hannah's explained some of the things that you can do prior to deployment, the importance of having a plan in place before you put yourself in harm's way, and the importance in, of thinking in advance about uh, the sort of situations you might find yourself, and, and Gavin's outlined some of the sort of emotional and psychological uh, things that can happen to the body and the mind under stress. And, uh, and in the third part of this session, I'm just going to talk from personal experience about how it all comes together uh, in a real-life situation. Um, this is me 10 years ago this month when I was a lot younger and a lot thinner than I am now uh, in northern Iraq. Uh, I was covering the Iraq war for the BBC and on April the 2nd, 2003, I went with my colleagues to a trench that Iraqi forces had left behind. They'd retreated uh, towards Baghdad and, and left this, this frontline position behind. Uh, we had a We'd done all our pre-preparation. We had a, a, an escort with us, a Kurdish soldier, who told us that the area that we were in was safe. But unfortunately, as, as I was to find out, the information that, that he gave us was, was wrong. Um, I stepped out of the jeep and immediately stepped on a, an anti-personnel landmine, uh, which was hidden beneath the ground. There was no sign of it there. Obviously, we wouldn't have put ourselves in that kind of danger if we knew there was a, a landmine there. Uh, and that mine blew off part of my right foot. Uh, the stress response, the confusion response kicks in immediately before you have time to think. And the cameraman that I was working with, Kaveh Golistan, an Iranian cameraman, did what you do instinctively in that situation, which is trying to get out of there, get to safety, uh, a flight or fight response. But by doing so, he ended up running further into what we later find, found out was a very heavily mined area, and Kaveh uh, was killed instantly. Uh, now, what do you do in a situation like that? You know, I knew that the decisions that I was going to make in the next few seconds could make the difference between life or death. I knew I was injured, but I knew that there were probably other landmines in the area. Uh, if there's, is the, they're not going to be just one there. There's going to be more than one. So what do, I, what do I do? Well, the natural reaction is to panic. Um, but Gavin's explained that that's possibly the worst thing you can do because if you start to panic... Uh, your fight or flight mechanism kicks in, your judgment's clouded, and, and you're more likely to make an impulsive decision to, to run away. Um, many of you will know the basic flight or fight response. I won't bore you with the uh, uh, physiology behind it, but if you're in a minefield, the worst thing you can do is to, is to run away um, because you're going to put yourself in a lot more danger. Um, by nature, I'm a a fairly high-strung person. I'm not by nature a particularly relaxed, chilled person, but I do remember very clearly in the moments after stepping on that landmine that, that I felt very calm, the um, hypoarousal that, that Gavin has referred to. I knew instinctively that this was a situation that was beyond my control. It was a situation that I probably had a limited ability to, to influence. I'd stepped on a landmine, I was injured. The question was what, I'm, what I was going to do next. So I, 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 I lay there looking at my foot, which was very badly damaged um, and bleeding. And I knew even if I wanted to run away, if I did want to uh, do the flight part of the fight or flight mechanism, I couldn't because I was injured. I could hop out of the way, but I thought, well, that was, that was a pretty stupid thing to do. It was not a very thing to do. Um, so I thought, well, what can I do next? And I racked my brains for anything I could do that might help keep me alive for the next 30 seconds, for the next one minute. I knew 
in that situation. If I worry, if I thought any further than the next 30 seconds or the next minute ahead, I'd just be completely overwhelmed by the enormity of what had just happened. I'd go into shock and I'd panic and, and I'd make bad decisions or there was a danger that I would make bad decisions. And so I tried to mentally create some sort of structure in my mind, a checklist in my head of what I could do to keep myself alive for the next 30 seconds, for the next minute, and the order in which I should carry out that. And in the chaos of that situation, it gave me, it was like a life belt. It was something that I could hold on to, something that I could do that would keep me uh, calm, keep me relatively relaxed, and it hopefully encourage me to make good decisions. So I knew from the hostile environments training that I had that you can bleed to death in 10 minutes from an uh, from a arterial bleed. So I thought, right, well, the single most important thing to do is to stop the bleeding. So I applied a tourniquet K to my leg. And I knew that if I'd stepped on one mine, there were probably other landmines in the area. There were no visible signs of them. I had no, no, no way of knowing where they were. So number two thing on my mental checklist was try to stay calm and just wait it out. Don't make any sudden movements, make any sudden decisions. Just stop uh, and give myself a second to think. And just taking those few seconds to stop and think before acting and weigh up what I was going to do next and come up with a basic plan, I'll never know, but could have made the decision, uh, could have made the difference for me between life and death. And I think that's as, as relevant in a, a hostage situation as, as anything else. It's just stop and think. You may not be able to change the situation. I'm sure you were going to be taken hostage, whatever you did. But... Uh, as, I'll, as I'll come to in a moment, the way that you react to a situation can make the difference. And then, once I'd taken that time and we'd managed to extract ourselves from the minefield, it was then that all the things that Hannah's been talking about, the, the pre-planning, the pre-preparation, started to kick in. We had a, a trauma kit in our vehicle, so I was able to administer first aid to myself and, and treat my injury. We knew where the nearest hospital was because we'd marked it on a map in advance because we knew we were in a dangerous area and we might need medical treatment. We had satellite phones in our, in our um, grab bags pre-programmed with a, uh, the, the numbers of our, our news desk in London so we didn't have to think in the chaos, what's that number again, what's that telephone? It was there, pick up the phone, speed dial, ring, get help. And they were able, the, the colleagues in London were able to, to call our families and tell them what happened and begin the process of, of um, evacuating me out of the country. Did we follow the plan that we'd prepared in advance to the letter? No. Um, one of my favorite quotes from the military uh, that's, that's equally relevant to journalism is that no, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Uh, you change the plan, you're flexible, and you change the plan as you go along depending on the situation. But we did have a plan. We'd thought through possible outcomes. What happens if someone gets injured? What happens if someone gets killed? Who do we need to phone? We need to have a phone in the first place so we can phone someone. Where are we going to go for help? So we had enough in a, of a plan already in place to work with in, in the critical situation. So in some ways, some of the stress was taken away. We weren't thinking, oh my God, suddenly we've got to find a hospital. Where's the nearest hospital? We knew where it was. And that bought us time, thinking time, which in any crisis situation, thinking time is the most precious commodity. Um, the outcome of, of what happened to me was still pretty bad. When I got back, um, my right leg was amputated below the knee. And, uh, you know, so my injury was pretty serious. But it could have been worse. You know, I did survive it. Um, and so, so my lesson from all of this is not that making clear decisions will stop bad things from happening, but they may stop a, a bad situation from turning into a tragedy. You can't stop bad things from happening but you can respond to them more effectively. Um, now, I've been working in, in foreign news for uh, more than a decade, and there, you know, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of changes in the industry, and there's no doubt that de the demands on us are getting greater all the time. We've got to keep up with the opposition. We've got to be on air first. We've got to be on air around the clock, and that can take its toll on us as human beings. We are only human after all. Um, there was a book written a few years ago uh, called No Time to Think, 
uh, about the news industry and many of us who work in news probably feel that we're often in that situation that we don't have time to think because of, because of the competing <laughs> demands on us um, uh, and some of the coverage of, of the way news organizations covered the Boston bombings last week when, the, when news organizations tried to keep up with the Twitter in, in the way that they reported the situation shows the danger of, of putting speed first and, and not taking time to think about what you're doing. So uh, I want to briefly finish by touching on something that, that we don't often talk about as journalists, that, and that's the importance of looking after ourselves. Uh, it's something that Gavin mentioned. So when we find ourselves in a difficult or dangerous situation, we're more likely to make good decisions. You, know, you mentioned the, the earthquake in Perugia. When, when the people woke up this morning, uh, that morning, I'm sure the last thing on their minds was that there was going to be an earthquake. They weren't in a war zone. A lot of us who work as journalists become, uh, find ourselves in situations that turn into war zones very quickly, whether that be Boston bombings, whether that be the 9-11 bombings, whether it be a natural disaster. You wake up expecting a perfectly normal day and then suddenly um, things change beyond recognition. Uh, in the military, there's a lot of discussion at the moment about the importance of, of psychological resilience. Uh, and it comes back to what we've been saying all along. You couldn't have stopped yourself being kidnapped. I couldn't have stopped myself stepping on that landmine. What I could change is the way I reacted to it. Um, and, and resilience is, is basically the ability to bounce back after exposure to stress. It doesn't mean we don't get stressed. Uh, stress is a natural reaction. It can be a healthy reaction in, in, in uh, moderate doses. But it does mean that we're able to deal with stress in a healthy way so that it doesn't affect our ability to cope long term and it doesn't affect our ability to make good decisions long term. And from my own experience, I think it's, you know, it's a powerful concept um, and it's just as relevant to us as journalists, especially when it, we're under more pressure than ever, that it, uh, it's as relevant to us as it is to, to somebody in the military. Um, and so I won't go into too much details. I'll just put that out there about the idea of looking into resilience. What you as, in, as an individual can do to build your resilience and to ensure that you don't get overwhelmed, that you don't go to pieces. It's all very well coping well in a crisis, but then if you sort of step away from that crisis and go to pieces afterwards, then that's you know, not, not the best outcome. If you're able to put yourself in stressful situations, deal with them healthily, and then put your, make yourself uh, resilient enough to put yourself in a, in a stressful situation again, um, that, that, then, that, then that's a better outcome, to have the flexibility and the mental strength to, to deal with stresses uh, time and again. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Gentleman at the front. Oh, that was the lady at the back, sorry. Hello. Um, I just have a question about fitness, because I've been, to, I've been through training... Um, in hostile environments and I've been to quite a few sessions like this and it's not something that people often talk about the importance of fitness for journalists in these situations and um, whether that's something you feel is important either in conflict zones generally difficult or dangerous situations um, or afterwards or before as a sort of stress reliever I think yeah I think it's really important I think it's a good point um, you know, as journalists, we're not known as being the, the healthiest profession in the world. Um, but, you know, I, obviously the, 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 there are obvious situations where the ability to get out of somewhere fast is affected by your physical fitness. And, and, and you know, we all know what are the supposed benefits of health in terms of, in terms of mental uh, resilience and the ability to sort of combat depression and so on. So I think it is an important one. I, it's, it's, it's noticeable that... Uh, the British military have a book called the Green Book where anybody who's going out to a war zone with the British military has to sign up to a sort of set of agreements and it covers everything from, you know, uh, the military's right to look at your article before you publish it. But it also, in the latest revision, does cover physical fitness as well because um, the military, the British military were finding that people were going out to war zones and they were overweight or they had high blood pressure and they didn't cope with heat very well and they didn't know how to look after themselves. And let's face it, if you can't look after yourself in, a, in London or, or New York or Rome, then you're not going to be able to look after yourself in 45 degree heat while wearing a flak jacket under fire. So 
I think it is an important one. Um, I think, you know, the fitter you are, the better. I don't think you have to be an absolute gym bunny, and I work with people of various degrees of fitness. But I think, you know, it is, it's, an, it's an important thing to mention. It's, yeah. a, it's an important point. If I can just add something to that, which I think is uh, useful to know, is that obviously being fit is important for a kind of general health viewpoint. It's pretty important if you think you might have to run to actually be able to run. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's a consideration if you need to get away from somewhere. But the other thing about exercise is that it's a good way of metabolizing excess distress. Yeah. So one, you know, if you're working, even if you're working at your desk and you're lo looking at lots of very traumatic images and are feeling quite aroused by them and you sort of feel that you're stewing a bit in that, then going out and doing exercise is a very good way of resetting the clock in your head, of taking your mind away from that, of giving yourself some space, and also effectively of um, eating up the excess cortisol so I don't know if you see people um, on the tube sometimes listening to dance music and they're sitting in their seats. So they're kind of sitting in, the, on the, you know, in a train, unable to move. And basically what they're doing is they're stewing in adrenaline, whereas that music is designed to be danced to. And if they were to dance to it, then they would be recalibrating their system. So exercise is very good for stress control. Can I just, well, if I can just add one thing from a personal perspective. I went through some fairly awful um, experiences uh, covering the Haiti earthquake. I've always been a runner, um, but after the Haiti earthquake, I was very, very poorly, partly because my body reacted to what I saw, partly because I got sick there. But several months after that, I ran a marathon. Now, I've run marathons before, but the training to that marathon, for I'm, n I'm not suggesting you all go out and run a marathon, so don't worry, but the training for that marathon was so beneficial and so helpful and, it, and it, I think it was a difference between me kind of going up and ending up uh, with the shrink on the shrink sofa um, or kind of, you know, it, it was a choice between going and sitting on the shrink sofa and talking it through and perhaps drinking too much and perhaps getting pissed and doing silly things or running the marathon which may well itself be silly but it, it helped me process things. Any more questions? Uh, there's one at the front. Yeah, hi, um, Hannah mentioned the, the, the preparation, the importance of preparation, and Stuart also mentioned that then plans need to change, and that therefore experience is uh, key. I mean, facing a situation is not like uh, uh, studying it, although preparing for it is absolutely essential. So based on that and your experience, how many bad decisions, or can you talk about the bad decisions that you took apart from obviously then accidents that not necessarily are caused by bad decisions. Uh, but really I'll be interested in knowing uh, from your experience wh how you feel about <laughs> cases where you, you took the, the wrong decision. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> No, I'm, I'm, I've, I've made plenty of bad decisions in my time. I, I, I mean, I found myself in situations where I think the biggest danger for, for us as journalists is that you can get a little bit of um, the adrenaline kicks in a bit too hard. And let's face it, you know, in, in, when you're working in war zones, there is a, a certain attraction to the danger in, in small doses. And I think uh, the danger can be that you get too caught up in that. And without knowing it, very gradually, your ability to make good decisions is impaired. And you may start the day or start an assignment with the best will in the world and the best plan in the world, but when you get there, you almost get a little bit overexcited like a, like a little kid in a toy shop, and then you start pushing the limits. And Gavin touched on the group dynamic side of things. I think, that, again, that's something that we don't talk a lot about as journalists. <laughs> the, if, you're in a, if you're with a group of people and you're all getting a a bit of an adrenaline buzz off the situation, then, then little by little you're, you, you, know, you can start to make bad decisions. Um, it's not a personal experience, but it, it, it's one that I've talked about recently with Sebastian Junger, who's an uh, American author and a friend of Tim Hetherington, an American photojournalist, uh, who was killed in Libya two years ago uh, in Benghazi. And Misrata. Sorry, in Misrata, sorry. In, and uh, talking to Sebastian, about that situation, he said that the way that Tim reacted on that day was very unusual for him. He was, very, he was not a risk taker. He wasn't a gung-ho guy. 
but the best description of what happened to him on that day was that he just got caught up in the excitement of the day. He went out in the morning, took photographs, came back. He had no reason to go out again. He got his photographs for the day. He got his story. But everybody else around him was saying, hey, let's go out for another hit. And the sort of, you know, the, the, the slightly addictive nature of adrenaline got to him. He went out again in the afternoon and got himself killed. So I think we need to be, my, I think my, you know, my philosophy is that you need to check yourself every once in a while and say, how far from my original plan have I shifted? Am I taking more risks now than I was this morning? And it's particularly the case if you're on a long assignment. You know, anybody who goes to somewhere difficult or dangerous for the first time, probably for the first week, as soon as they hear something go bang, they jump. And then after a few days, you're sitting there and something goes bang and you just go, oh, okay, cool. And it just becomes normal. Uh, that in some ways is natural and, and be, you're bound to be de desensitized to it after a while. But that, the danger is that you then start pushing your limits I think further. I, I think I'd just add, um, you have to be quite aware of what your motive is as well what your own personal motive is. There's a very brief story that I, you know, I'll just tell you very quickly. Um, I saw a slide last week. I was teaching some students um, who were going off overseas and um, we showed them a slide of um, a reporter from the Vietnamese War. Um, and he described the fact that he had looked through his binoculars and seen a village where there were no chickens. And he thought, that's a bit odd. Not really happy about going into this village where there's no chickens. And another colleague comes along and, and says, oh, come on, come on, we'll, we'll be fine, let's, let's go. And he said, no, I'm not feeling great about this, but the other colleague had just come back from being away. He just had a kind of... Uh, he'd been taken off the story for a while. It was his first story back after quite a long time. He felt he had something to prove. So this one, the number one guy goes off, doesn't cover the village. Number two guy goes in, covers a story doesn't survive, gets killed. The whole village has been uh, scattered. The chickens have gone, the, the villagers have gone, and um, the group of soldiers come in a bit later on and kill everybody else who's there who happened to be this guy journalist and, the, and a friend of his. So I guess that's just a kind of... Qu I'm not saying it's entirely the motive, that the motive was bad, but do be aware of, of, of your motives for going into a story. Are you trying to prove something that perhaps you oughtn't to be proving? And I think I would just say, you know, for, for, for people setting out on their career, for young journalists, you know, I, I know we've all been there. There is a, not even in, in necessarily in, in particularly dangerous situations, just in day-to-day -day stories, there is, there is a, sometimes a feeling that, you, you know, if you're working with somebody who's senior, somebody, maybe somebody, if those of you who work in television, if you're working with a, a famous face, there is sometimes the, rea the natural reaction is, I've got some misgivings about this, but I'm just going to keep quiet because I don't want to make a fool of myself. And, and I, would, I would urge anybody setting out on their careers to try to resist that instinct. Your, your gut instincts, your opinions are just as valuable and just as important as anybody else. And one of the things I've learned over time is I try now to work, I, I work uh, across different media, but what's, uh, and telev when I'm working in television, where the teams tend to be larger, I try to surround myself with people I actually like and get on with. And I ask myself, is this somebody that I would want to hang out with and have a beer with in the evening? And that goes for everybody, from the fixer to the cameraman to the correspondent, everybody. I try to work with people I like because I found over time that if I'm working with people I like, I'm more likely to listen to what they've got to say, uh, take what they're saying seriously. And actually, I don't want to put them in danger. Uh, and I don't want to, if they're uncomfortable, if I'm taking them or to a situation that makes them uncomfortable, that's, that I feel a personal responsibility to them. So. It's, it's difficult. You often get thrown together. Again, again, it comes back to the group dynamic. You often get thrown together in a team. You don't know who you're going to be working with. If you do have the opportunity to sort of find groups of people you like working with, even if you're a freelance and you largely work with one, you know, you work on your own, if you can team up with other people and create a sort of, uh, you know, a little, t you know, a team of buddies, having that buddy system can be a really important check and a really valuable check. Uh, that can that can help you make better decisions. You do see the you see the best and the worst sides of people in dangerous situations. So, you know that's something to bear in mind as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean it's also I mean the person who's being very kind of loud and arrogant and bullish, perhaps. It's also worth thinking about where that might come from, and that could be a way of them dealing with their anxiety and the sense of being in a threatening situation. 
So we haven't, I mean, Stuart actually has, I think, underlined it just now, but it's something we didn't talk about earlier in our presentations. But that's the importance of being like a, a good colleague and kind of leadership. And so if somebody's not doing so well in a difficult situation, it's working out how the best way of, of, of getting through that as a group. And one of the worst things that any of us can do if we're with somebody who's finding things difficult is to kind of use, is to sort of adopt a blaming mode, mm -hmm. and that really is destructive because it kind of pushes them into a kind of difficult, difficult place. And and if the team isn't feeling, if the other people in the team are feeling that there's an that there's a, an argument or a conflict or an issue that isn't being dealt with, it can kind of undermine everybody. So one of the things that the um, military learned during the Second World War was that the two most important factors in soldiers breaking down under the stress of combat. One was getting a, a Dear John letter. So you get a letter, basically, Dear John, uh, from a, a girlfriend or a wife saying, Dear John, you've been a, away for a terribly long time and I met this lovely man who's in the RAF who's stationed in Britain. Um, and he understands me, and I'm afraid to say we're going to get married, or something along those lines. That, that kind of experience was very destabilizing for people at a distance. Um, but the other one, in fact, the, 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 the biggest lesson they got from, from the Second World War um, was that units in which the officers weren't very good and weren't respected by their soldiers and didn't know how to look out for juniors were the, office, were the units that had the biggest degree of kind of psychological breakdown in stressful situations. Um, so it's worth thinking about. Can I, take one more question? Can I, can I just yeah. mention something quickly, following on from that? I, I, I mean, those of us who, uh, in any kind of news, uh, whether it be foreign news or domestic news, it's very easy, especially in the early part of your career, to think that, that, that the world in which you're operating is, is real life. I know from experience that going from assignment to assignment is very, feels very glamorous and very attractive, and you want to keep doing it. And then in my situation, you know, I, I'd spent my 20s traveling, uh, working abroad, and then suddenly I was, found myself in this sort of life-changing situation. And I really realized the importance of having a network outside work of family and friends and people who could kind of get me through that situation. So I would just encourage anybody, don't think life on the road is real life. It's not. And there may come a time where you need to have a wider social network. Those people will make the difference between you getting through and going under. So, you know, we all have had to cancel dinner dates because as the deadline comes up or something happens. But, you know, I don't want to get too airy-fairy and psychological about it, but don't neglect your family and friends. Try to have a life outside journalism. Um, because, I've, you know, if you can. <laughs> but because... I mean, we've all, I'm sure we've all seen this sort of sad old guy or woman in the corner of the newsroom who doesn't want to retire because they know that they'll just drink themselves to death as soon as they retire. So, you know, what we do is great. We're very privileged to, to do what we do, but we, we need a, a real life as well. Anything else from anybody? We've got about two more minutes, so we could probably take one more question. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for this interesting panel discussion. I'm a, an Italian colleague uh, working in this field since five or maybe six years. And I have two questions, one for Gavin and one for Hannah and Stuart. And uh, please um, explain to the people sitting here what are the psychological consequences for journalists who work in these fields. And exactly what the post-traumatic stress disorder is. You know that many of us are affected by this trauma after a lot of years working in these fields. And, but sometimes we are shy to tell this truth. And the second for Anna and Stuart is um, something practical related to communication in these fields uh, that you didn't mention before. Um, for example, how to deal with secret services in some countries, you know? Uh, how much expose uh, has on this kind of stress and how to use or don't use our phone or our iPhone or our tablet as well. And we know it's very important to prevent dangers. Okay, okay shall I start off? Um, I'll try and do this quickly. I think we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna steal 
three, four minutes maybe from the next session because we started a bit until late. We out. Yeah, until we get kicked out. And uh, anyway, um, so post traumatic stress disorder or PTSD um, is what can happen when the um, survival stress response completely fails to turn off. So, in other words, um, we, if you think about the kind of squirrel being very kind of stressed, uh, and a human being's stress response lasts longer, it may take you know, a number of, of weeks or even months for the system to calm down after a particularly kind of disturbing or violent situation. But in the vast majority of cases, people, so, we, so when people are very stressed, they might experience distressed, they might experience um, flashbacks, so these are images of the thing happening again, their system may, main may still be chemically primed, so it could wake up in the middle of the night uh, full of adrenaline, have night sweats, or could find their system shutting down, so they might, in a, in a very serious case, uh, lose the capacity to love and to have connection with other people. So this is a situation in which the stress mechanism fails to recalibrate, and it gets in the way of having a kind of normal, um, kind of happy and secure life. Um, it is very treatable, so if that happens, it's something that people can look into getting treatment. And of all of the kind of um, psychological conditions that we can get, it's actually one of the most treatable. So it's certainly not a, a death sentence. And a lot of people who think they've got PTSD actually haven't got it. They've just, because you have to have a quite a high density of symptoms in, in order to have it. Now, in terms of the figures, um, Within the journalism community, um, it's, it's depending on which study you're looking at, it's probably about four to six percent of the, the whole journalism community, which is um, better than the general population. Um, for war correspondents and war reporters, the best um, study suggests that lifetime prevalence of PTSD is 28 percent. So it doesn't mean that of that sample, 28% had it. It meant that some people had it once and then recovered. So I, think, I can't remember what the figure was for the number in the sample. It's for about 19%, I think, of the people in that study. Um, for trauma reporters more generally, so those are people who do things like hu intensive human rights work, spend a lot of time interviewing rape victims um, or torture victims, we're probably talking about somewhere between 10 and 15%. So it's not just being threatened, it's the um, material that we work with. So a classic thing is that somebody who's working with sexual abuse survivors might find themselves, just before they're going to, you know, when they're falling asleep, dreaming that they're being attacked, and then it starts to become their reality. Um, so that's that. Uh, if anybody wants any more information, then look at our website or come and find me, and I can give you lots of facts and figures and talk you about, tell you about it much more. Uh, I hope I'm going to ask you a question correctly. Uh, it seems you're talking about digital security when, when to, and actually, with perfect timing, Brian Connolly, the gentleman with the beard there, from Small World News, uh, is doing a lot of work on the digital security field. My basic assumption is assume if you're in a, if you're in a situation, if you're in an environment where somebody uh, may want access to your sensitive information, I assume I start with the assumption that every that someone can can listen in and hack anything that I'm doing. Uh, so I take basic precautions like I wouldn't carry sensitive phone numbers on my mobile phone. Uh, I wouldn't carry sensitive documents, names, addresses of anybody who might get themselves injured or killed as a result of talking to a journalist. Making sure I carry clean phones. Uh, we use trackers, uh, GPS trackers, that if anything happens to us, if we get kidnapped, then uh, there's a possibility that, 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 that people can, can work out, uh, find out where we are. Um, the, the whole digital security area is, is, is an emerging field. It's one that, we're, one that we're very mindful of, and I think it's, it's certainly one that we in large news organizations have been sort of slow to catch up on. Um, there are some good resources out there now. The Committee for the Protection of Journalists has got a digital security guide. Brian has helped write a digital security guide. So you know, I, would, I would basically urge you to maybe have a chat with Brian about things that, that, that you can do, but with the basic assumption that, that uh, a little bit... Of, somebody said to me when I asked them about digital security for, for journalists, they said a bit of healthy paranoia is sometimes a good thing. So a bit of healthy common sense is sometimes a good thing as well. 
Uh, and there's also another website called Tactical Tech, and they have uh, materials to advice for activists as well. Ryan, did you want to come say. in on that? Just before we close. Yeah, oh. the, the only thing I would say is that essentially, I, I think people assume that because they're using. Uh, microphone's just coming to you, yeah. Um, I, you know, I think that basically anything that you wouldn't want compromised if you were kidnapped or arrested or detained, you shouldn't think that just because you put it in your phone or your computer with a password that it's better off. You know, it, it, Stu is right. That yes, they could be listening. At the end of the day, they're probably not. You know, and, and in the situation where if you're dealing with criminals as opposed to state governments, often I think you're at more risk. And you might think you're at less risk because they don't have the NSA. But I'd much get more scared of what uh, Mexican drug cartels can do because they don't have any sort of legal limitation or framework. And in fact, you know, by and large, those frameworks still do have a place. Great. Um, so I think we have to pack up now. And so thanks very much for contributing to that. I hope you found it a useful Thank discussion. You. Thank you. Yeah.